You know, traveling with another healthcare traveler has always been kind of a challenge. Well, actually, I'll say I heard it wasn't back in the earliest days of this industry. But it's always been a challenge, especially now. It is definitely a bigger and more complicated puzzle piece for your agency to put together to make sure that both of you guys are finding the best assignment, the highest pay that makes sense. We're going to talk about traveling with a partner on this week's edition of Travel Evolved. This is Travel Evolved. I am Mark Holloway, CEO of NextGen MedStaff. Welcome, and your host, by the way. Welcome to the episode, ladies and gentlemen. Really glad you're joining us. I just, again, I know I say this a lot, but I really am grateful for those of you that subscribe uh, to our podcast. I subscribe to, I think, only about four or five. Um, And so it's nice, because I do get notifications. I got one guy who's like this, he's kind of a nutrition guru, and he's older, not as old as me. But the dude's in sick shape, so I do listen to it. And he's also a doctor. So I listen to what he has to say, but I like it because, much like this, he, I guess, titles his uh, podcast, or actually he's a YouTube guy. And which is cool because I can say, ah, I don't want to watch that, or I do. And it's cool to me because I can save him. I understand that most of you, well, I shouldn't say most of you, many of you don't, you know, wait on bated breath for us to release one of these because obviously it just doesn't happen. Uh, For those that subscribe, I think that's cool because you get the notification. And we're so grateful for that because really and truly, it's one of the best ways for us to know if we're doing things well here. And again, I'll tell the story one last time for those of you that are new or haven't heard this before. We created this series and what we planned on doing here two years ago, two years ago, I guess. Wow, has it been two years? It has been. And we wrote down about, I think it was the high, you know, 180, 190, almost, almost 200 episodes. We said, if we can do about 50 episodes every year, which is almost one a week, we knew there'd be some times we wouldn't be able to get some in. We tried to do it about every six days because we want to release an episode on a different day of the week. We do know, you know, social media-wise that Fridays are the best day to release a, you know, a YouTube or a podcast, but we didn't care because healthcare travelers don't really follow the same you know, work week as everybody else does. So we, we knew it wouldn't really matter. Clearly, we have not been able to adhere to that. What's happened over the last couple of years is things have obviously changed and transformed and, and moved around a lot. So we've added episodes. We we knew we wanted to get as many guests as we could. A lot of times the episodes that we what we do, I, I'm certainly not an expert at that. So I really try to find somebody who is for an episode that I'm a little ignorant on or maybe don't have quite enough knowledge, but we knew it was something that needed to be discussed, uh, especially a lot of the numbers and financial stuff that I'm just not qualified to answer. That being, you know, that and also we always invite you guys to to come on and i wish more of you would i wish more of you guys would reach out and say hey i got a burning thing that's just driving me crazy or something i just absolutely love or i found this amazing tip or something that i do or a ritual i do before every assignment or during assignment i think that if i can convince some of you to come out of your shell a little bit and join me on these you'll find it's it's a lot of fun and and i think it's a really great way to help people where i can't this series is supposed to give you guys some insight that you probably have never heard from an agency standpoint because most people in our, on our side of the, of, of the desk, as I always say, are unwilling or hesitant to share some stuff with you. And there's reasons. I mean, it's not unique to our industry. There's a lot of industries where you know, the people that are you know, on this part of whatever this part is in their industry are hesitant to talk about what they're doing. They don't want their competitors to know. They don't want their, their consumer to know. And you guys are kind of a consumer but you're also kind of, in my opinion, the commodity, which is 
weird to say, but also the truth. And you guys need to treat yourself like you're a, a really um, valuable commodity, because I think you are. So anyway, we've created all these episodes, and the idea is that it's now grown to over 200. And I would say that would mean we're almost halfway done. We're about two years in. We have two more, but we're really now closer. And I would say we'll probably have around 250 if we keep kind of adding the episodes with guests and things that pop up, we probably have another, I think we're at 210 or something like that. So probably another 40 episodes over the next, eventually, I think three years, which means this this thing will probably last about five years. And then who knows what we'll be doing. Um, but hopefully it's something else, whatever the trend is at that point. But that's kind of our general thought. So again, um, I really am, am very appreciative because we, we can see on the podcast, sometimes on some of the platforms, we can see how many people listen to the episode iTunes, which is our like two thirds of our listeners are on that, we can't see barely any demographics from that. We don't know how many people subscribe. We don't know how many people listen. Uh, we get it from Spotify. They're really good, so we know where we are with Spotify. And we try to like multiply that number by the the pie that they give us. Does that make sense? So, anyway, the point I'm making is that we're incredibly grateful for every one of you. It's um, I get, and I, I wanted to say this in this episode. I get that for a lot of people, they tell us. You're really valuable because I think we really hit it on all, all the cylinders for people that really need this information, which sometimes is either a, a newer traveler or somebody who has now decided that they really want to get to become a better, more evolved traveler. So we're hitting it with those people. I think for a lot of you, there are certain episodes that kind of make you go, wow, you know, here, that's interesting. And I would imagine that every episode is is not, you know, a religious thing that you would listen to every time. But I hope that for a lot of you kind of drive-by listeners that these episodes that that resonate with you that you listen to them and you share them because that's important so the last thing i'll say it one more time if you're one of those people that something i said go man i gotta i gotta i gotta i gotta get on with that guy please do it, it will help everybody it helps us because i want freshness and good ideas and like i said i can only offer this i'm not out there if you guys are out there and there's something that i completely am clueless about which i guarantee there's a lot we could sure use the help to help other travelers. I just would appreciate it. So reach out through us through our Facebook group, which is Travel Evolve. Join us on there. We were going live for a while. It got a little daunting for me, a little overwhelming, especially when we were going to Florida. And now we're back here and we're heading to California soon. So I think I'm going to pick those back up once we get out to the West Coast. Probably only one night a week because it was just too much. And um, we may move the time around a little bit so we can have other people. But I thought those were great. It just was really hard to, you know, Oh my gosh, I got I, I've got this going on, but I've got to stop and go live on on Facebook. It, it was hard, so we're gonna do it again. So that's also another area and a way for you guys to kind of see what we're doing. We'll we'll talk about the episodes. We'll throw out a topic that's kind of new today. So there's that. Um, last episode, I told you that I hadn't finished. I, I had another page or a half a page of things on the how recruiters make money. Turned out I did finish it. The half page was from another episode, so I. I can't see because I don't have my glasses on when I do these things, and I probably should wear them, but I, I don't want to look older because I'm at that age where I don't want to look older than I am, and I, I am older. Um, so I should have my glasses on and realize that that was the back half of my page. So we finished that episode. So apologize for that awkward end there, but I thought, oh, my gosh, I've gone an hour, and there's still half a page there, and I felt like that was it. Turned out it was. So a lot of explanation, a lot of big, long intro. Let's jump into this one, Traveling with the Partner. Here's what I'll say about this episode. We did, in fact, this is another one of those that was on the list, and we tried to kind of time it. You know, this could have easily been one of the first episodes we had done, but we really wanted to kind of intermix some things that are a little lighter, a little bit more maybe specific to some of you and not so specific to others so you guys could pass on some or whatever. This one was interesting because we knew it was coming up, but to me it's really, I don't know if it's good or bad, that it's happening during a period of time where things are a little bit thin, a little bit weird, so it, it really is more important right now than it's ever been to kind of you know hear how to travel with uh, with another traveler and we do talk a little bit about how to travel with a significant other or a, or a spouse that sort of thing we will talk about that in a minute but it's really not a very long part of this it's mostly about two travelers getting positions together and i'm going to try to do the episode as if things aren't thin because what i was getting at earlier is for those of you that do subscribe I would like you to think about how things are right now. If you are traveling with a partner, really take them to heart because there's definitely some things that are tougher now than they've ever been because of, I guess, just kind of the way things are kind of thin right now. I don't know if that's seasonal or whatever, but there's we seem to be at a weird period of time where there's 
less positions than we've seen any other time in the spring before. I don't know why that is. However, we also know that these episodes have a long life and that sort of thing because we see people watching episodes that were way up, you know, way back. So this also should be something that two or three years from now should still make sense. So we'll try not to have it be quite so unique as to the time that we're experiencing right now because what I'll tell you today is pretty, you know, complete at any given point. So there's my, whatever you want to call it, my preamble for this. All right, just real briefly, all I want to say about traveling with a non-healthcare traveler, again, a child, a friend, uh, you know, a loved one, a significant other, a spouse, is that anymore, it used to be when us agencies provided significantly more of the housing that we do, it would be something that you would kind of have to get your agency or your recruiter at that time involved in. Now with, you know, with the way things have, have evolved and changed, which is, I, you know, I've always said, the lack of agencies providing housing has shifted the responsibility and the burden from us, as always, directly onto the traveler, which is great for the agency, but it's a, yet another thing that you guys are on the hook for. So a lot more risk and all that kind of stuff on your part. But along with that means you don't have to tell anybody. It's your business. So it's not so much that the agency needs to know now, but what I will tell you is make sure that you know, you, you've kind of thought about the housing rules before you go. And I'm not talking about like an Airbnb. I mean, if you're staying at a hotel, find out what the deal is there. Same thing with traveling with a pet. Understand that if, if it's something like that, that somebody else who's going to be there, make sure that you're, they're on the lease. Make sure that they're there. I've seen you know, travelers say they forgot to do that. A lot of people have a, a significant other or a spouse that travels and does kind of other things on the side, maybe semi-retired, that sort of thing. So that's all I'll tell you. Just make sure on whatever lease you're signing for a non-traveler, real briefly, is just check your lease and check the rules uh, before before you uh, before you, you kind of sign on the line that is dotted, so to speak. Here's the other real serious thing I want to mention, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but it is just some. It's a good opportunity for me to talk about safety. We talked about this a lot in the social media episode, safety on the road. And obviously, if it's your spouse or significant other, this does not apply. But I have, I will tell you guys, one of the advantages I've had for being in this industry as long as I have is I've heard just about everything. Things that, I mean, they're kind of funny, but some things are so outrageous that it's not even funny. It's, it's. I mean, you'll tell the story like I could tell you here. I'll tell you one here to like a friend that's not in the business. No, no names being used. But I've seen it all and I've heard just about other things. Things that are just like you have got to be kidding me. You guys can imagine. Forget about just the fact when I first started in this industry and the stuff that happened during strikes. Holy cow. So, you know, baptism by fire, so to speak. But over the last 23 years, I mean, I really have just about heard some of the craziest stuff you ever hear. But one of the things that's pretty consistent, it bears repeating again, is if you're, if this is a new partner or new friend, new acquaintance, new love of your life, I cannot remember how many times, so it's been a lot that people have told me that things get changed on the road. And, you know, just here's what I'll say without saying it. Make sure you trust and know the person that you are signing off on to come live with you and that this is truly the right thing. And that's a weird thing for me to say, but again, it just bears repeating that if there's any kind of weird warning sign, just figure out a way to, to not travel with that person. Does that make sense? All right, let's get on to the whew. That's just hard to even, I don't even want to talk about it, but it happens a lot, guys. I mean, I get to be pretty good friends with a lot of travelers, and they'll tell me stuff like, oh, my gosh, I came back, and, and she was gone, he was gone, and my place was empty, and never saw him again, and I, you know, tears and all that stuff on the phone. It's hard to hear that, and you kind of go, didn't you see the signs? And the truth is, they probably didn't, so be careful. All right, let's jump into the real part of the episode, traveling with another traveler. Here's, here's some things. First and foremost, Traveling with somebody else is, it just adds to the puzzle. What I mean by puzzle is that every one of your stories, every one of your combination of unique variables that you guys are looking for for every assignment creates a puzzle for that recruiter or, you know, I keep talking about what we're doing, or, or, you know, if you're using something that you're not using a recruiter for, you've got to put those filters or those variables in. The more that that is, the more the, the larger the amount that is, the more difficult the assignment is. Let's just be frank. So let me say what I'm talking about. If you are only licensed in two places and you're a nurse, or let's say you're an alley but you only want to go so far away from home. If you only want to work days or you only want to work nights, if you don't want any call, 
if you're only willing to take to look at assignments that are this much and above, every one of those things does in fact filter a thinner and thinner funnel, if that all makes sense. Throw in things like you know, maybe certifications, maybe you have the bare minimum. I mean, all those things are that traveler marketability I always talk about opens things up. But again, you're assuming when we talk about this sort of thing that you're going to get interviewed and hired for every single job that matches what's left after you filter everything else out. And we all know that's not the case. So already, the more filters you have, you're just minimizing your opportunity that you're able to go to work. Okay, so what? You don't want to you don't want to change your filters if they're important to you. Keep those filters, right? You don't want to take a job that's not the right fit unless you kind of have to, which is, you know, again, part of your marketability and what you're willing to do and hopefully that ebbs and flows each time. You know, you're going to have times when you're going to have to accept less or go further or do whatever and other times where you're not going to have to. But clearly, every time you add a variable, that is a challenge for yourself, your agency, your recruiter, to be able to find as many of those positions that fit what's remaining after you filtered everything else out. So that's the number one thing. Now start throwing in a second thing, another traveler. And I'll talk about a few things here. The easiest, by the way, in my opinion, and it's just a, this is absolutely an opinion, is two travelers that have the exact same specialty and, and everything's the same, like I say, like two rad techs or two physical therapists or two ICU nurses two surge techs. That seems to be easier because clearly, and I'll tell you what you'll do with that. It just seems to line up. You're looking for positions that have more than one need. That makes life easier. When you start dealing with you know different specialties, I mean, I've had allied and nursing that travel together. I've had different levels of you know nursing. I've had RNs that travel with LPNs and vice versa. That does make it oftentimes more difficult because it just seems to be harder to search for that. So if a recruiter is doing that, understand that you're putting a bigger burden on him or her than any other traveler is, which again goes back to what I've always said. You could be, could be, you could be slipping down the priority list. Now, the other, the opposite thought is that it's two commissions, right? So depending upon how difficult and how many variables you have, you could be going up or down. And of course, depending upon that recruiter's work ethic, how lazy, how easy this is, it all comes into play. But Understand that for every single one of you, all that combination is different and it has a lot to do with each individual, let's say, agency that you're working for. So it's challenging. Again, you're you're if you if you are traveling with somebody that, that has a lower bill rate, for example, like we talked about last week, you know, that's gonna drop you down. If you're traveling with somebody who has a higher bill rate, it's gonna pull you up. You're you're a bigger priority for that recruiter because this is what they're looking for. They're looking for the bigger commission and, and you're good or vice versa. So everything comes into play, but do understand that it is really, it adds, it doubles the, the puzzle piece. It's already difficult enough sometimes to have things match up, you know, especially for anybody who has a, 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 a more specialized specialty, if, you, if that makes sense. In other words, less positions like a, a PICU nurse as opposed to an ICU nurse, definitely fewer travel positions for a PICU than there is for ICU. So that's already a challenge. And if there's two PICU nurses traveling together, that's that's going to be difficult. It's going to make a, a lot of burden. So again, not to talk about time here. Right now, it's really tough, but anytime it's difficult. So realize that. Um, I want you to consider at any point, again, you should have an honest look at both of your marketability. And what I mean by that is we did a whole episode on traveler marketability. In other words, marketability isn't just how strong your resume is or how many credentials you have. It has things to do with where can you work? You know, you might be an RN with a Compact State license, but you're traveling with somebody who is a, let's say a surgical technician and you know they don't have the couple of states that require a certification, but they can work in most states because they're a CST, for example. So that's part of it. But the other thing is your marketability also consists of where are you willing to go? So also know that, that the more filters, the more finite your, your combined destination that lines up is, the more difficult that's, that's going to be. So you really do need to have an honest look at both of your marketability. In other words, how high on the pile do each of you go? If, you're, if, you're, if your friend or partner or spouse is super credentialed and super qualified and has more experience than you do, there's an opportunity to say, okay, I can't change the years of experience I have, but I may be able to get higher certifications, get some better references so that I am not the one that's keeping us both 
from getting you know the positions that we're looking for. It's just an honest thing that you kind of have to do, and it's a tough conversation, especially if you know again if this is a, a relationship that you have with somebody. But you're going to have to get both of your marketability as high as you can because you're looking for two jobs, not one, and it's going to be it's going to be a lot more difficult. Um, I guess the the thing that I have to talk about in regard to this is if you do travel, and most of you guys know this that travel together, you may have to consider that both of you may not get an offer and you have to make a decision as to are we going to go with one of us getting an offer that is lucrative for example and the other one who's going to do everything we can to try to find either another assignment at a, at a hopefully what is a neighboring facility potentially there could be some per diem opportunities in that town which is a great option doing some research to find out what the what the again opportunities are there but consider does it make sense? And I'm certainly I can't tell you here. Every every situation would vary, but does it make sense if one of us gets the position that we go? Obviously, we're talking about people that share and <laughs> share incomes, right? If it's if it's two friends that like you know, then it probably wouldn't make any sense. I mean, hey, I love you to death, but I'm not going just because you got a job. That doesn't make sense for me. So in those situations where you guys do share an income, then you know it may or may not make sense for for both of you to go. You know, if the assignment makes sense, if one of you gets a lucrative offer, I should say, a lot of that's going to have to do with how big is the city, what kind of opportunities they have, is there opportunity for other facilities with you know maybe that a different agency might have, or is there per diem or a, a way for me to do something that's going to supplement that income in the event that one of us doesn't get a job the entire 13 weeks, but the other one does, what could be done? So it may have some bearing on it, but consider that I've had that happen before. Um, without any guarantees, I hope I would hope that your agency wouldn't be guaranteeing you. Hey, you go, and I and we'll get you know him or her a job because that's just a lot of responsibility. And I don't know a good agency that would promise anything like that. But just realize that that could be a possibility. I'm not saying it's a good one, but it's one of those things. The facts are is that what I can tell you, when I was probably a little bit more involved in in this than than I certainly have been over the last probably decade, is the idea is that many managers are hesitant to bring in people that travel together, especially those that do share an income. In other words, people that are couples, because they tend to, again, not you guys, I know, but they tend to make promises about scheduling and things that they don't need. We don't need to have the same day off. It doesn't matter if one of us is on call and the other one isn't. You know, you know we don't care about days or nights, but something miraculously happens to a lot of travelers, again, not you guys, that when they get there, what was talked about during the interview seems to sometimes change. And that's, you know, again, what's happened is some bad apples have kind of you know, poisoned the well, so to speak. It's, it's, it hurts you guys now because if a manager has had multiple experience with hiring people that travel together, and if it's put more of a burden on, again, a traveler is supposed to kind of ease the burden, right? I mean, if you really go back to episode two or three with my friend Angela, and that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be helping them, right? Either waiting for them to be able to hire, helping them during a high you know, census or getting them through a tough time for whatever reason that it is, the last thing that a traveler should be doing is actually making their scheduling more difficult. And sometimes that happens. So if a manager has that happen to him or her a couple of times, they're going to say, no more, no more traveling couples. That's just the way it is. It's always been that way. So you really need to think about what are our kind of rules? What are our, what are our boundaries that we're willing to you know, look beyond and what is it kind of a, this is a deal break for me and, and ask those questions. I know sometimes you guys aren't always uh, given an honest answer as well. I've had a, I've had husband and wife teams that work in and, you know, like PACU and OR before. Um, and they've been made promises. And at, when they got there, you know, Oh, I know we said this, but we're, we're going crazy and this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. And now we need you guys to be taking opposite call and all kinds of stuff. And it's, it, I get that you haven't always aren't, aren't given the right answer or maybe an honest answer or truly things do change. But I think if you have the conversation, hey, this is one of those things that if, if this is going to happen, we're, we may not be the right fit. And stick with that. I think you're going to have a better assignment. Yes, you may be passed over, but would you rather be passed over or would you rather take an assignment and then have that happen every single week or, or predominantly during the course of the assignment? You only you know exactly what your deal breaker you know, kind of uh, variables, as we said earlier, are. So stick with them. And I would say absolutely do your best to cover them and take notes 
if you're given a decent or even a, a remotely decent interview, hopefully over the phone. So you can at least kind of have a good conversation with that manager. Because like I've always said, it's really hard for him or her, knowing they talk to you on the phone, to go back and say, well, I never said that. Oh, well, yeah, you did right here. I've got the notes. Here's my notes from our conversation. You said right here. It's just as harder. So have the conversation. It doesn't mean it's not going to happen, but it does kind of protect you a little bit. And again, I know a lot of this stuff is redundant to you guys. A lot of stuff is like, you know, Common Sense 101. And most of you guys know this, but this is just one of those things that I think having it here in an episode for anybody who doesn't know it or for those of you to refresh your memory or if all of a sudden now you're traveling with a partner, this is this is why we do the episodes, guys. So here's kind of the biggest one I will tell you. Um, I've always advised travelers that travel together or want to travel together to look for assignments in bigger cities. I mean, having more than one facility or even two as a potential option for where you can land an assignment makes a lot of sense. In other words, the bigger the city, the more hospitals are there. It doesn't necessarily have to be with one agency. It could be with multiple agencies. So you guys both be looking at, I'm just going to throw out Baltimore, Maryland. There's a lot of hospitals in Baltimore. So there's a lot more opportunity for a relatively close proximity, which means shared housing with not too far away. Or maybe one of you you know, has to be on call and you're closer to that, you know, person's facility than yours. But what I'm getting at is that it's going to be really hard and, and almost let, you know, the sky's part to, you know, just have everything line up perfectly for you to get two assignments. And again, whatever your variable is at an exact same facility, especially right now. I, I wasn't going to do that, right? I was going to try to keep this timeless so it didn't have to do with right now. So clearly, the first, and I mean, I should have said that right away from the very beginning, but I didn't organize this the way I'm probably thinking I should have now. Number one for me would be bigger city. So hopefully you're a bigger city person because that's going to really expand the opportunity. It's going to help with per diem too. So like I said earlier, if some of you or if one of you, you know, isn't getting position, if there's, you know, a city that has a, a huge per diem uh, need and there's a couple per diem agencies, that's a great place for you to call and say, okay, I'll do this. And heck, I've seen it where the per diem person actually makes more money than the traveler does in some in sometimes some cases. So, but research it uh, on per diem. I'm not going to have a, a conversation or an episode on per diem, but there's a lot of towns. Denver, where I am currently right now, is one of those where there are so many transient healthcare providers here that barely any travel currently in Denver. There, there's one big system here, as you guys know, and there's a couple. A couple others that have two to whatever, two to four in them. And of course, Denver's a pretty big, you know, metro area, so there's a lot surrounding it. But right now, because of the population or the popularity, I should say, of this city, and there's others out there, there's not a lot of huge needs for someone that we don't have anybody for 13 weeks. So what they're doing is they're using per diem. So a lot of travelers are flocking here right now, and I'll, I'll give you examples of other cities in a minute. And so there's so many that now what they're finding is that there's not enough shifts for them to make living. So what will happen is a lot of those people will have no choice but to either go permanent or go somewhere else. I mean, I remember I remember a long time ago, I don't remember exactly when it was, but the first city I remember this being a big deal was was in Seattle. And I mean, I'm kind of dating myself. But you guys know how long I've been doing this, but it was kind of the grunge movement. You know, the end of the grunge movement. Because the grunge movement was like midnight. This was toward the end of the, you know, 1999-2000. I am dating myself. Um, early on, I remember Seattle being so popular that that area stopped having travel needs, if you could believe that, for quite a while because it was such a popular city. <clears throat> the more common one I remember, and you guys may, if you've been doing this for any length of time, was Las Vegas. <clears throat> Excuse me. Las Vegas has difficulties now. It had difficulty early on, but for a little while there, Vegas, Summerlin, South Vegas, all the, the kind of the you know the nicer areas of that town didn't seem to have a lot of trouble with staffing because there were so many people moving there because it was a good cost of living. I know it's hotter than you know what there, but it was, it's a, I mean, it's Vegas is a great town. You know, it's a lot, you know, it, it, I'm not going to say what's a lot like, but it, it was popular. So for a while there, I remember there was like barely any jobs for about four or five years in Las Vegas. And by the way, it was at that time, the number one growing, largest growing you know, city in the United States. And I think Denver still is holding that right now. If not, maybe we're dropped down to two, but I can feel it. One of the reasons I don't, it's just tough here is that it's just, this city was not meant to be as busy as it is. I live in a community that kind of was, so I don't mind it and I don't like to go out of my bubble, but if I have to go downtown or whatever, it's 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 a nightmare anymore. Uh, it's a lot like, you know, 
going on the going on the five or the ten out in California. It's really tough. So anyway, what I'm getting at is that the bigger the city, the more options there are. Which kind of brings me to the next point or a combination of those two. Use multiple agencies. I've always said that with everybody. And I'll I'll throw this out there again. You guys may be shocked, and I'm just I'm just telling you what no one else wants to say because they don't want you to run to another company. You should always be using multiple agencies right now. I, again, I don't know why you would have loyalty to anybody, including mine, except for pay and opportunity. So there's two things. Where do I want to go? If there's an agency that has those jobs, you're kind of going to go there. If there's an agency that doesn't, you may not want to work with them. I get that. That's real. And pay is the other one. If an agency doesn't pay well, you shouldn't go with them. So those are the kind of the two variables. Many of you, it seems like to me and other other people in my position and and a lot of folks that are on this side of the business that I talk to have agreed with me that over the last five years for sure, so, I mean, I think COVID did this. It certainly was starting to happen. But when COVID hit, the loyalty went out the, out, the, out the door, which it's about time that happened. It always should have, but for whatever reason, some agencies were really, really good at convincing you that their brand was better than the exact same looking brand across town. COVID kind of changed that. You guys, whether you're a new traveler or you're a veteran traveler, either you were smart from the get-go or your eyes were open. You said, wait a minute. I, I, you know, I'm not going to go with this time. I've got, I'm seeing things on social media that are, that are literally $1,000 a week more, and that's not exaggeration during COVID. I think that was a really good thing for you guys. If you remember back, and again, I haven't listened to them, but go back and listen to the first dozen episodes of this. I'm sure I told you at that point to go where the money was. And I think I said that you shouldn't be loyal to any company. The only company I'd be loyal to is the one that has the highest pay rates. I'd be careful burning bridges with them. I mean, I'm just going to, I wouldn't burn bridges with Next End Med staff. I wouldn't take an assignment and not go there because right now we're not. But it's that kind of company. Other similar companies. You guys already know there's about 10 companies that seem to predominantly be the highest paying for the jobs that they have. If I'm a traveler, I wouldn't burn a bridge with those companies. If money's important to you, if it's not, then go ahead. And, and you know, it, it, maybe you have a different variable. The other thing I wouldn't do is I wouldn't burn a bridge with a company that seems to have a lot of jobs in an area or a state or a city or cities that other companies don't. And sometimes that's the big company. But if there's a company that has, and I don't want to give an example, that that's, has a lot of positions in a general area or, like I said, a state, I wouldn't burn a bridge with that company because what are you going to do if they are mad at you? If you take an assignment or get terminated or walk off an assignment, those are the only two things I would really consider. And they said, I think at one point, the third thing, and I know I'm off script here as always. The third thing is if you happen to have a pre-existing or insurance need that is very unique and there's only a handful of companies that give you a really great benefit or a low deductible, whatever it is, and there's a couple of companies out there that really hit that out of the, you know, out of the park, and that's an important thing, and I could see how it would be. And there's a handful of companies that really do great with that, and it actually probably helps you and really makes more financial sense. I wouldn't burn a bridge with that company. Other than that, there's no loyalty, and I will tell you, my counterparts are finally realizing that there isn't, which is kind of cool. I mean, it really makes sense. So what I said would happen, and again, this is now episode 94. Let's see if I get to episode 144 and see if this happens over the next year. I think that companies will now continue to work harder to earn your business. I know I'm not talking about traveling with a partner. I always said there'd be some nuggets in there. Sometimes my brain just works like this, and I think of things that I always want to get out there. This is one of those. I'll predict right now that if this trend continues where the loyalty isn't there, which I think is a good thing, I really do, it then forces agencies to raise their game. No matter what, 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 listen, I'm going to California to work on what I feel my company needs to strengthen. And it, 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 you know, it wasn't predicted. We were focusing so much on you know, technology that I feel, okay, now we're growing so quickly that it's clear to me that there's some work that needs to be done quickly on some of the other areas that are you know, more humanistic and related, you know, HR, payroll, credentialing, that sort of thing, customer service. It's important to me that, that we raise that up now because we didn't expect that. We knew we could handle you know, 100, 150, but not where we're at. So we got some work to do. I got some hiring to do, and I've got some training to do, and some, you know, that sort of thing. So that's what we're doing. We're going to raise our game to meet the demands of what our travelers are telling us. And I think everybody across the board is going to do that. And if money's one of those things, 
which it seems like we're all saying that's what's become important to you. Good for you guys. There's only one way to change that, and that is to raise the pay rate, which means some tough decisions are going to have to be made at a lot of companies out there. Now, I, I got, I'm so far off topic, but I, I want to finish this thought. There will be, like I said, I think it was last episode, there are companies that are so big that have so many positions that they probably won't or need to raise their rate to the level everybody else is going to have to. Follow me on this. If they've got more positions and some monopolistic opportunities where no one else has, they're not going to. They don't need to. They're going to keep their margins where they are. And if I'm running one of those big companies, that's exactly what I'm going to focus on. It's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing for you guys. Well, it kind of is. But it's a real thing. In other words, if they don't have to raise their rate to be, to be chosen by you guys, they're not going to. So that's fine. Because those people where the location is important, and if they continue to deliver for those areas without having to farm those jobs out to the rest of us, which is where they get caught in kind of a little bit of trouble when we can pay more than they can for their own job, it happens, then that's going to continue. And it's like I said, it's, it's, it is kind of a bad thing for you guys if you want to go to certain places and make a lot of money, but it's probably what's going to happen. I don't think they're going to raise their rate as much or they'll, still, they'll lag behind. I'm thinking out loud, live, which is never a good idea. I will tell you now, that as I'm thinking about this, I think they'll raise, but they'll they'll kind of be behind everybody because it'll, if, it, if it stays there and these guys go up, they'll be so low that it'll become obvious that people won't want to. And the destination and that monopolistic opportunity they have will start to become a lesser importance to you guys, maybe. So they will come up to make it so that, okay, I'll take it, but just to that bare minimum. The rest of us, I truly believe, are going to be fighting for more opportunity and Figuring out how to pay you guys more, like like you know, again, we're not done. I told you guys. You guys know that we're, our rates keep our, our margins keep dropping. Our slice of the pie. It's important to me that we keep shrinking that. In order to do that, I've got to make sure that technology can do some things that um, allow us to do this. So we're not spending money on on people and and that sort of thing and hiring, hiring, hiring to be able to provide that for you. So that's kind of the goal. And I think other companies are going to think as we do. How do I pay a traveler more money? And there's only one way to do it, and that truly is to cut operating expenses and, and to do the best you can with cost of goods sold so that you're not spending too much on drug screens and background checks and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's important, too, but the biggest expense you can cut is your operating. So, wow, way off topic. How did I even get there? I don't know where I was going. Larger cities? Yeah, I guess I was talking about that. Whew. My apologies. Let's get back on. All right, the other thing I'll tell you guys... <laughs> That was actually kind of funny. I don't think I've ever gone quite that far off topic on, on in 94 episodes, but I did tonight. Probably because there's not a lot of stuff here in this episode, but I want to make it interesting. So I would tell you guys, for those of you that travel together, and most of you that do this know that, but if you're new at this, start planning way ahead. In other words, the average traveler, and again, this, this changes, but the average traveler has kind of a window that they know based upon their own traveler marketability that they know where they have to start looking. Again, what if they're taking a week off? So if they're, it's from their start date, not from their assignment ends, but if they're, some of you guys can get an assignment literally three weeks before you're ready to start, which is about the minimum because there's credentialing involved. But some of you guys are so marketable and, and, and I mean that by where you're open to and just the fact that you're almost always on the top of the pile that you know this. And you can literally start looking for an assignment that close to the end of yours because you can decide if you want to stay and all that sort of thing. I will tell you guys, and you probably also know this, that that probably changes based upon a lot of the supply and demand. There may be periods of time, whether it's seasonal or you know consistently every year, or it's you know just like right now, where all of a sudden you know you may be extending that based upon what you hear from your your counterparts and other people out there. But for a lot of you, it's closer. For some of you, it's further away. For a traveling pair. You, you need to be, in my opinion, submitting way further than the average you know, single traveling alone traveler. You just do. Because of that thing I said at the very beginning, that the puzzle piece is much more complicated. There's more things to match up, which means there's less opportunity. So you gotta, you got to start looking and getting your feelers out there you know, way, way in advance. And I'll say it again because I wrote it down here after this, even though I've discussed it, and that is you really shouldn't be putting all your eggs in one basket. Forget about the money and the loyalty. You guys, again, there's two different kinds of people that travel together. Those that share an income that are a couple and those that are friends. For, for those of you that are a couple 
and you share an income, this is where you've got to say, we can't be without a job because we have, and you've got some options with, with that area. But for both of those kind of descriptions, it still means you have to plan in advance, and I still would recommend not putting all your eggs in one basket. You guys already talked about money, and I just said that a few minutes ago, money's important. But again, for those of you that are traveling together, you've got to look at the conglomerate of what the two jobs are. So you may take, and I'll say this probably, well, I'll say it now, so I'll say it later. Two lower paying positions might make sense, a lot more sense than one high paying position and someone else not getting a job or someone having to be forced to work per diem without any guarantee, if that makes sense to you. So if you truly are a shared income couple that's traveling, then it may be okay for you guys to both take a you know a slightly lower paying position because you're still bringing in heavy revenue and again that's going to ebb and flow just like a single travel you're you're cheek you're uh, you're treating your combined careers as a business model so go back to that episode so instead of just being one of you it's now two of you so it's kind of fun to think about but you'll have a different dynamic every assignment what are we making as a couple you know you made a lot of money here i didn't here maybe we can travel maybe we need to go our separate ways for just 13 weeks and be apart and make crazy money but all that comes into play with a dual income. When it comes to two other people, you definitely got to just sit there and say, we're going to both find the best job we can. I think most of you that travel as friends, and let's be frank, I mean, you're kind of looking out for yourself, number one. Yeah, you'd like to have an assignment with a friend or someone who's a really good buddy of yours or someone that you truly like, but it may mean that you're not willing to necessarily walk away from something or not accept an opportunity that you have, especially if you have a higher marketability per, you know, of the two, so to speak. But regardless, even more so than just what I said about working, you know, having no loyalty because of money, you definitely got to start early and you start should start with more agencies than the average single traveler. In other words, if, and I had a guy the other day tell me, three is kind of my limit. You know, when I'm looking for an assignment, I'll only do paper for three because I, I'm good enough that I feel I can get a job. And I think that's a fair thing for him to say. If I'm traveling with another ER nurse, I may double that. I may say we should be working with a total of six, and you tell your three that there's two of us. I'll tell my three that there's two of us, and let's see what we can do together. And you know, it's doubling the amount. So maybe not doubling your own individual effort, but you probably should be looking at twice the amount of agencies that the average traveler should be looking at because you've got to figure out who's got what contract where and what are my chances of getting booked with more people. And let's be honest, the more agencies you work with, the higher chance you have of actually getting assignment and, and getting booked, right? So do that for sure. The last thing I'll tell you, well, not the last, I guess, yeah, kind of, almost the last thing I'm going to tell you is you got to market the hell out of yourself. And what I mean by market, I'm not talking about traveler marketability. I'm now talking about the fact that most of you or a lot of you, I think kind of the majority of you veteran travelers seem to be finding your own positions one way, shape or form. Most of you are still going through a company or a recruiter, but a lot of you guys are, are getting your own job. And you know what I'm talking about. You're finding a, a posting and you're telling your favorite three, hey, do you guys have this? Because I saw this and this is exactly where I want to go. And then you're figuring out who's paying the most. So you're doing that work. I mean, sure, some of you get a recruiter call, but a lot of you guys are looking at the Facebook post group, which kind of drive me crazy because they're, they're just inefficient as all get out. Or you're doing you know, a recruiter's app like we have where you are looking for your own position and or you're looking at you know, an online you know, uh, type uh, website that compares rates or gives you, you know, the best agencies that are paying the highest currently that have an active job right now, even though those are oftentimes not quite as accurate as, as other things can be. I would accelerate that campaign if you're traveling together. If you're traveling together, you have to elevate that. Again, busier, more complicated puzzle piece. So consider that this isn't just me now. I've got to double my market, marketing uh, uh, my marketing outreach. And again, this is not traveler marketability. You've already accomplished that. But now I'm going to go out there and, and really put myself out there. I'm going to have them saturate the market so I can really make sure that I'm getting at least hopefully seeing or looking for double the amount of opportunities so I can see if I, I can personally match that puzzle piece up. Again, whether you're using a recruiter list model like we have or you're, you're going out and finding jobs on different areas, whether it's websites or Facebook posts and you're trying to find your own job, you guys tell me you do that anyway. And more and more of you are, which is why I, I see things shifting. But I would I would market the hell out of myself. All right, one of the last things I do want to say, and, and I'm going to, again, I... I, I pretty good. I don't do this as much as I used to, but I used to beat up the big companies a lot because I just felt like 
back then, you know, a couple of years ago, we all had a lot of jobs, and I think that's happening again. I just, I just hated how high their margins are. And more and more as I talk about things, I, I do try to come up with things that I think are actually valuable. I, I'll tell you this. I think the more variables that you both have for your puzzle piece, the more a bigger and potentially monolith type company actually might make sense, which again is just an honest thing. I mean, if you have a lot of variables and you're tough and your traveling friend or partner is tough too, frankly, the bigger the company, the better chance, in my opinion, you have of getting that matched up with more options. Yes, any size company might be able to get it, but it's going to be more of a luck thing. The larger the company is, you're probably increasing your chances of having that match up. Now, on the on the downside, like I said earlier, you're probably not going to make nearly as much as you guys would if you got lucky with a smaller company that's paying more. But that's where it goes back to, you know, two incomes makes more sense than potentially one. And it often, it usually will. So just kind of consider that. I mean, maybe you maybe you look at some of the companies that have been successful for you guys in the past, see if they have something that matches up. But I would quickly start moving to companies that have lower pay rates but have more opportunity because if this traveling together thing is either a must-have or really high on your list of, of priority, and it's a really important thing to you, then the more important that is, the quicker I would go to a, a larger agency and be willing to make less money and, and let money be less of my reason for traveling and having my partner or my friend be the bigger reason why I'm traveling. And, and money's going to have to, unfortunately, kind of be a secondary thing. So make as much as you can, but that's what I'm saying. Go with the bigger companies. are They're just better at that. So, guys, hope this one is fast. But this one is pretty quick. I've been trying to keep them to 40, and sometimes they go to 60 minutes, so we'll see. But <sighs> traveling with a partner. I hope it all makes sense. I hope this is timeless. I hope it's not just about craziness right now, but... The, the lower demand and the higher supply, the more this stuff is going to be important to those of you that travel with a partner. Guys, I'll catch you next time on Travel Evolved.